Hello, Faithful Politics listeners. This is Josh Bertram, your faithful host. I'm joined today by your ever, ever, I guess, should I say faithful, ever political? That's a good one. Ever political, political host. Will. Hi, Will. How's it going? Going well. Yeah, thanks for asking, Josh. Absolutely. And then we have today with us Daniel Silliman. Daniel is a journalist and a historian. He's the news editor for Christianity Today and the author of A History of Best-Selling Evangelical Fiction and Teaches Humanities at Milligan University. Daniel spent several years as a crime reporter outside Atlanta before pursuing higher education in Germany. He earned an MA from Tübingen University and a doctoral degree from Heidelberg University. And he was a teaching fellow at the University of New uh, Notre Dame from 2016 to 2017, and a Lilly postdoctoral fellow at Valparaiso, I uh, hope I'm saying that right, University from 2017 to 2019, and he's reported and edited news coverage for Christianity Today since 2019. Daniel, thanks so much for being on the show with us today. Good to be here. Good. Well, Daniel, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what brought you to where you are, crime reporter. What else have you done? You've been a master chef at some point. Uh, what, what, what brought you where you are today? I worked at a gas station selling lottery tickets. I worked at a <laughs> there you go. I've done a couple of different things. Yeah, I I loved um, journalism from an early age, um, and have really felt like that's the the thing I should pursue. And of course, uh, of course, history is just journalism with dead people. So it's not that <laughs> old news, old news re-explored. Yeah, but um, but I've specialized uh, in uh, American evangelicals more more recently. So I started out on the time beat. I worked at a at a paper south of Atlanta. I had a hundred murders in two and a half years. It was a pretty intense time. Oh, uh, and learned a lot about telling stories and tracking down facts and trying to just, uh, you know, play it as straight as possible and just give people the information they needed to wrestle with questions like what's wrong with our community and what should we be doing? And how do we, how do we change court? How did we get here? And how do we go somewhere different than, than here? Uh, and then I, I actually um, followed my followed my wife to Germany. She she's an ordained evangelical minister in the Independent Christian Church, and she uh, was asked to help start a campus ministry at Tübingen. So I followed her, and then had to kind of rethink about. It turns out they didn't need a lot of crime journalists in English in southern southwestern Germany. <laughs> um, yeah, so I found my way into an American studies program and there connected with a really great historian um, who was doing history of American evangelicals named Jan Steverman. And I worked with him and, and followed him. So I went to Heidelberg, but I worked also with Jan there. I followed Jan to Heidelberg uh, working on this uh, history project, which uh, turned into this book, Reading Evangelicals. <laughs> that, that, that's really cool. So, so for for our listeners that don't know what Christianity Today is, can you yeah, can you sure. kind of give us some um, you know some background about what they do, their mission, their purpose, their uh, their origin story, if you will? Yeah, it's generally referred to as the flagship magazine for American evans evangelicals, which I guess assumes you know what a flagship is, but. Um, uh, yeah, it's a it's a leading magazine for evangelicals, and the news is about evangelicals. So I I really write and report and edit stories on uh, news for evangelicals, not just in America but but around the world. It was started in 1956. It was a project um, of Billy Graham's. Billy Graham, in addition to being a uh, America's most famous preacher at the time also um, started a bunch of institutions, colleges, uh, the National Association of Evangelicals, and this magazine. Part of the project at the time was to distinguish from certain set of conservatives who at that time would have identified as fundamentalists to be a little more ecumenical, to be committed to um, the 
the truth of the Bible and the resurrection of Jesus and, and, and Christian orthodoxy, but also um, not fundamentalist. I think that's probably the quickest way to say that. Uh, yeah, so we're going on, what, 60 years? Um, a little more than 60 years. And um, the news team, news has also always been an important part, which is interesting. There's a lot of evangelical or conservative Christian magazines over the years that are sort of strictly about takes or Bible study materials. Um, and we have that too, but Christianity Today has also always been committed to sort of factual reporting what's going on in the world um we assume that our readers are keeping up with news in the normal ways um but want to know so we're not trying to replace your local newspaper or cable tv or something but um but also want to know about what christians are doing so sometimes that means i'm looking at a national situation like the recent mass shooting in uvalde and finding a pastor who's affected or something like that and, and telling his story that might not be picked up by um, a national newspaper. Other times it means reporting on stories that just wouldn't even rise to the, to the attention. So I recently did a piece, for example, on 60-plus um, Wesleyan theologians who come together to sign a statement, uh, a sort of theological document, trying to articulate a... Uh, clearly Wesleyan theology. That's not going to get picked up by um, a regular <laughs> newspaper. It's not interesting to all your readers, but, you know, to those who go to a Methodist church or those yeah. who, you know, maybe they're Baptist and they think of themselves as Reformed and they go, what, what, is the, what are the Wesleyans up to? Maybe I'm actually more Wesleyan than I am Reformed. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, we cover a variety of things, though. That's so cool. Yeah, I love Christianity today. I've been a long time subscriber. So thank you for the work that you do and the, and the new podcasts and that are coming out. I think it's excellent. You guys are doing excellent work there. You know, you were mentioning that you learned and when you were working uh, as a crime reporter, you learned how to investigate things, how to find things out, how to, um, yeah, like get to the bottom of a story. Uh, talk about that methodology a little bit before we jump into your book. Mm -hmm. And some different articles and things like that. Um, how uh, describe the methodology? How do you get from uh, seeing something that y you get an idea, you get a rumor, or whatever? How do you go from that into finding out if that's uh, actually based in fact or not? Yeah, it is a really the the craft of the job is really interesting to, to to me. It's something I spend a lot of time thinking about. the the first The first thing you learn as a journalist is just to call people or go talk to people. Um, it actually it kind of feels like a superpower. It's kind of amazing. You can just call people and go, "Hey, I'm a journalist." I'd like to know about this thing. You seem like you know a lot about it. Would you talk to me? And people. People do. It's not like they have to, but they're, they're happy to talk. Um, yeah, so a normal story that I'm reporting on, it involves talking to as many people as possible, as many people as is reasonable, and people hopefully from, from all sides of an issue. That's sort of your basic tool. Find the people who are relevant to a situation, get them to tell you stuff, and then kind of condense it, right? The other part of reporting is like taking out the jargon, making it clear, adding context, um, trying to explain it as succinctly as possible. Sometimes though, the investigation is actually more investigative. Um, I have uh, been doing for the last couple of years, um, long, longer, deeper investigations of abuse, um, starting with the investigation into Ravi Zacharias, who is the led the world's largest apologetics ministry, um, which was named after himself. And I uncovered um, the fact that he owns some day spas, co owns some day spas, which is a little odd for a um, prominent Christian minister to also own spas. Uh, and he was uh, sexually abusing uh, women who worked there. 
So in, in something like that, you can't just call someone and go, hey, are you sexually be like that? That's not how that works. I mean, you do call them and ask, but you can't just sort of take people's word for it. Um, so that involves tracking down people who don't want to talk or who maybe are afraid to talk. In this case, I, one of the women, I, I spoke to three women um, who'd been abused. One of them had moved changed professions and changed her name. So it took a while to find her. And wow. then her first response when I found her wasn't, oh yes, of course I'll talk to you. I've been waiting her, you know, she had to be convinced that I would uh, protect her and that I was going to, you know, appropriately use her story and that there were, there was a good, that it was worth the risk that she was taking to, to talk to me. Uh, the other thing is to find documents. You know, we live in a society where we all leave paper trails and we all leave records and you have to kind of learn the backsides of bureaucracies to find that information. Sometimes, you know, that's, uh, business records. Sometimes that's emails. Um, other times you have a whistleblower who will like record a secret meeting and then send you the recording. Um, or, you know, or people who will send you all the emails they got from someone or, that's or other amazing. types of documents, you know, internal reports or something. So part, a lot of that is knowing like what to look for, what kind of documents might exist and then finding, um, finding out how to, how to get them. Um, and sometimes the documents aren't, you know, directly related to what you're investigating either, but they still tell you a lot. Back when I was a crime reporter, for I, example, I had a case where a, a, a police officer was accused of murder while off duty. He, he was convicted of this later. He, he shot uh, a man who was married to the woman he was sleeping with. So he was having an affair and decided oh to, to kill the husband. And I found, for example, that he'd been divorced several years before the divorce had nothing to do with the crime but it actually told me a lot about him. Like I actually kind of learned sure. his life story and how he got to this crazy position where it seemed like a good idea to murder someone. So, so that's an example of like, you know, you go, you think, well, has he ever been divorced? Let me go check. Let me go check the court records there. Yeah. It's not relevant, but there might be some useful information. So it's, yeah, a, so it's like it's this, this craft of digging and yeah. and thinking like what traces do people leave as they, move through this world. And then how could this actually tell me some kind of information that would be relevant or information that would be helpful to you getting at the bottom of whatever it is I'm trying to figure out. You kind of start do you find yourself or do you find yourself like um like constantly editing your your initial hypothesis? Um sometimes I, t I tend to start with a pretty open theory of the case, right? Like it tends to not be too worked out. It's like, Hey, I think something happened here or hmm. I, heard, I heard this. That's interesting. Uh, I don't tend to have it too worked out. Um, but that's yeah, I think, I think the impulse that drives me is I just want to know everything, right? I, I kind of want, I want all the information. So yeah, I'm like that too. I'm the person, when you go to a museum with me, other people you want to read everything. Yeah, I want all. I want to. Well, I'm here. I paid ten bucks to get in the door. Let me read every single part. Exactly. Other people are like I, I have to, well, you can relate to that, can't you, Will? Yeah. Well, I got kids, so generally, like when when yeah. I take my kids to the museum, it's it's we're you in. Can't go with kids. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, yeah. That's not the same thing. Yeah. That that makes that makes so much sense. So, yeah. I mean, it, it's so fascinating to me. Um, how like I love the work that journalists do. It's actually super interesting to me because I love doing research. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever I hear someone talk about it, I'm like, man, that would be amazing. That'd be awesome. Maybe I'll become a crime reporter in my next life. What do you think, Will? Good backup plan. Yeah, sure. If, yeah, this, well, if, this, if this pastor thing doesn't work out, you know, then then you yeah, got to reincarnated. You know, that's like Christian, isn't it? Somewhere. Some Christian believes in that somewhere, probably. You know, um, but uh, yeah, it's um, it's so fascinating. It, it, and what's interesting to me is how you moved. So, okay, help me understand. 
Mm-hmm. Well, and I understand how you move from uh, the guy who killed his lover's husband. Yeah. To. Uh, <laughs> to um, uh, to Mennonite and Amish uh, fiction. Maybe you don't cover it. <laughs> that, but the, the Christian yeah. fiction and the, you know, and the, uh, um, you, you know, and, and this present darkness and, and, and the things that are um, and, and, and the rapture and, and left behind and all that stuff. Um, how did you end up writing this book? How did you even, why do you even want to write it? Well, first, what's the book about? And then how, how did you, how did you even end up getting here? Yeah. So the book is a history of best-selling Christian fiction. I look at five. Are there murderers in those Christian authors? Novels. Uh, you know, there is a whole genre of Christian crime novels. Uh, none of them are quite successful enough to make it into the best. Because they can't be like, they can't be vile enough. You know what I mean? They have to be Christian, but they can't really talk about the dirt, you know, because they're selling to a certain audience. I don't know. What do you think? Well, there are a lot of crime novels that aren't that extreme. There's, you know, there's a whole story <laughs> called Cozy Mysteries, for example. <laughs> The, the interesting thing about the Christian crime novels is, you know, a, a detective in any good crime novel kind of leads you on a tour through a segment of society. So if you read like Walter Mosley, who's a really popular African-American novelist, mm. so great about him isn't like that the crimes are specifically different, but he'll take you on this little tour of like a historic African-American community where he's chose to set the crime. So in the Christian crime novels, you'll end up with like one of the witnesses is at a mega church. So he has to spend some time snooping around a mega church. And that's like part of the culture that's included in these. Um, right. But yeah, that's a, sorry for that rabbit trail. So no, I should apologize for that rabbit trail. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so in the, the, the larger argument of the book, of my book, is that um, to understand evangelicals, we should spend less time focusing on a kind of theological core or a political core and instead think about um, their imagination, like how do evangelicals imagine the world? How do they picture the world? What do they kind of think? How do, how do they um, how do they dream about the landscape? Um, and then secondly, imagination, and secondly, infrastructure. What are the actual ways that we organize um, um, our imaginative approach? So bookstores and novels work pretty well for me to just give me some insight into who are evangelicals. Um, and how have they moved through modern American history? And, and the big takeaway for, for me is that their evangelicalism is much more contingent. This is a big historian word. We like contingency uh, as a category of, of, of a, a thing to pay attention to. But evangelical history is more contingent. It actually could have gone a lot of different directions. It's not quite as predetermined as a lot of the theological and political histories have made it seem. Uh, and then secondly, that evangelicalism is pluralistic. There's actually a bunch of different things kind of all held together, um, you know, in the Christian bookstore. And that evangelicalism, you know, can include, for example, culture war, and that can be a, a way that evangelicals yeah. imagine that um, being a faithful Christian works out in the works out in the real world in the modern world is to fight your neighbors. And if you're really faithful, you'll be at school board meetings, aggressive, you know, combating people. But that's right. not. But that's not the only way. So simultaneously, right next to that. You have Christian romance novels where they're imagining that a faithful life will, in, will, will look like individual flourishing. It'll look like having a good marriage and having a good mm. kids and being able to, you know, be happy at the end of the day in your suburban home. Those are both evangelical imaginations. 
they can be combined, but they're not always combined, and they kind of sit next to each other. Where do they sit next to each other? How do they sit next to each other? Well, the Christian bookstore is one is one way. Hmm. As to the as to the how I got into it, the 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 middle the middle piece for moving from being a reporter focusing on crime to being a historian writing about novels was being interested in media networks. So when I started in grad school, I thought I was going to write about newspapers and magazines and how, how they cultivate a readership and kind of create a community, like how to, how do newspapers create a community in their neighborhood and create a sense of what it means to belong? How do religious magazines create a movement that the movement kind of doesn't exist until the conversation that the magazine starts pulls all these different people in together? Um, and so that was interesting. And I started on that. I didn't particularly like the media studies professor. Um, he kind of, just didn't care. That was really the big thing. His stuff was interesting, but he was kind of bored with his own topics. <laughs> uh, and then I really liked the guy who was focusing on religion. Uh, he was really great and had some interest in these questions. And so I identified the book market as a, as a way to take my experience of journalism and start applying it to history and um, religious, religious folks. I suppose the other piece is that as an evangelical who has a eclectic religious background, um, that's probably putting it mildly, but I, I had a bunch of different experiences. And so I was always kind of interested in exploring and explaining different people's religious understandings of the world. Um, and I even found this as a crime reporter. You know, I went to a lot of funerals as a crime reporter. And so you'd see different ways of praying and different ways communities came together. And I started including that in my reporting and found that it really surprised a lot of people. A lot of people kind of didn't know how to see religion, didn't know how to see the cultural practices of belief. Um, and when you can describe those, those actually open up a lot for people about, um, a lot for the reader about what people really care about. Yeah, you know, Daniel, if if we could, because um, I'm always I'm always real sensitive to um, our our listenership, and you know, we have um, listeners, viewers that are Christian, non Christian believers, what have you. Um, can can you can you define like um, what an evangelical is, and like what is evangelical evangelic Evangelicalism. I always get that word messed up. <laughs> so uh, maybe you can just sort of. You're use... clearly not an evangelical. Yeah, clearly, clearly I'm not. <laughs> so, so, so what what is that when, when you're talking about an evangelical? Yeah, these are the the Protestant Christians who have um, focused more on less on institutions historically. Um, so they tended to break away from the very established denominations with hierarchies, not always, but tended to, and say things like, um, you know, it's just about your personal relationship with Jesus, or, you know, you need to read the Bible and not, not carry on all this tradition from everywhere. Just read, everyone should be able to read the Bible for them, for themselves. Uh, a lot of historians have used sort of four theological points, um, which is called the Bevington Quadrilateral, which is emphasis on the cross um, and what Jesus did on the cross, emphasis on the Bible and that the Bible is the highest authority, uh, emphasis on, um, oh man, I'm blanking on the third one. I think it's Jesus, I think is the third one. Um, and then uh, activism, that, that, should, that faith should mean something in the world. Part of my work has been criticizing those this theological centers and instead seeing it as a pretty loose and changing um, trans-denominational religious movements, right? So one of the questions in American history is, Theologically, a lot of white Christians and black Christians have agreed, and yet they haven't been in conversation with each other. And that's not for theological yeah. reasons. It's for <clears throat> cultural reasons. 
reasons. So yes. some, some some black Christians identify as evangelical and some don't. And the distinction is about who's talking with who, not who believes what. So, mm -hmm. so to talk about it as a historical movement, I would say, you know, in the Second Great Awakening, which is around Andrew Jackson's time, you ended up with this kind of revivalistic movement outside of the churches, on the frontiers, churches that are a lot more democratic. They don't really like experts coming in and telling them stuff. And that's the kind of birth of this new kind of religious conversation. Um, and then really after World War II, it really kind of explodes. Um, this is the Billy Graham era. Um, part of this is that a lot of the established Protestant churches are getting very, very liberal and saying things like, well, it's all kind of a myth and you should just, you know, it's about the eternal spirits and how we're all brothers. And Jesus was a great example. And for a lot of people that felt like, well, then why? Why even bother? What are we even doing here? Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they built networks and conversations like Christianity Today. And anyone who thought those conversations were interesting and joined in on them, I think counts as an evangelical. So it's almost as if what I hear you saying is that evangelical emerged, evangelicalism emerged in America. Because we probably have to distinguish, right? Between American evangelicalism and, and, and evangelicalism outside of the U.S. The United States, would you say that's correct? That they're distinguishing markers. Uh, yeah, though. Like United, like English, like UK evangelicalism. Yeah. The, so there, there is a global evangelicalism. Um, it's often connected historically to American evangelicalism. Right, that makes sense. So it does get distinct. Yeah. That, okay, that makes sense. You know, in Australia. There's all sorts of evangelicals who are in the Anglican Church, and then there's Pentecostals. And in the U.S., so. in the U.S., Pentecostals and everybody else talk together a little bit more. In Australia, okay. Pentecostals are kind of off to the side. So it changes. But, but that's why, for me, it really helps to look at, like, well, what are the networks? How do people talk to each other? Um, right. And it's religious people who talk to each other who form evangelicalism. Totally. And that, that makes sense. It was almost as if it was, would you say it was almost like a reaction against like the one thing I heard you say is like almost a reaction against kind of the trends that were seen in maybe like these, these, these more progressive liberal the, and, and theologically liberal trends that were happening in mainline denominations. Was it like almost like in the beginning of the church, like theology didn't get like the first 300 years, right, or, or longer theology didn't get um, really defined until someone came in that brought a theology that was a heresy, that, that made people react against it because, of, well, that's not true, so we now have to, would you say it's something similar to that? Yeah, um, I think that's not that's not wrong. In the in the 1800s it really ends up being a reaction against reaction might not be the best word. It's a response to like creedalism and these very elaborate sort of formal documents and then also a mm -hmm. uh, sense that the established churches were too authoritarian. They sort of said we're the professionals, mm -hmm. we'll tell you what to believe. And the small D Democratic Americans were like not okay with that. That was not. Yeah, okay. dude, that doesn't offend the American spirit. That doesn't work. Um, and you know, and there's some good Christian belief reasons too, right? If the Holy Spirit moves, I don't think the Holy Spirit only touches people who have degrees. You know, it's that <laughs> that kind of talk. You know, so there are lots of stories from that time of like children preaching. And people gathering and saying, "Well, I don't, you know, let's let's hear them out." Um, Especially Pentecostals, man. A lot of enslaved people preaching. So you got you had a lot of um, you know black people having the first chance to read the Bible and speak to a public audience. You had women preaching. So it was against a kind of it was an anti formal movement at that time. That part still exists. That's still there. But in the 1950s and on. Um, well, especially in that moment in the 1950s, there was a rejection of um, 
of a very sort of polite liberalism kind of a Christianity for sure. Um, you know, this, um, the stereotype is like the Easter sermon. That's just about how spring is a nice metaphor. Um, and it's like, well, that, that's, that's the kind of extreme version. But then on the other hand, there was an emergent fundamentalism that they were also trying to distinguish themselves. You know, people who thought fighting evolutionists was the key to everything. People who thought Catholics were definitely evil and taking over the world through an evil conspiracy. So, so evangelicalism was trying to, especially as Billy Graham and people like Carl Henry did it, was trying to find this middle space yeah. between what looks like to them, it's sort of a wishy-washy liberal theology and uh, angry, fighty fundamentalism on the other hand. That makes a lot of sense. But those lines so, all the time, right? So, so yeah, totally. that's how that worked in one moment. As a historian, I don't think that we can just say, okay, that's who evangelicals are. Oh, totally. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. You know, it, it, moving to your book a little bit, um, like we've been getting, like, get, get an overview of the context. So when we're talking about the imagination, when people... Um, you know, you made the point, like, you don't, when you're thinking about evangelicalism, don't just look at the politics, don't just look at the, yeah. you know, don't just look at the culture war issues, don't just look at those things. Look at the imagination, look at the things they fantasize about, the things they think about, the things that they put as ideals or get their imagination moving. So help me understand, the, help me understand, draw the line between some of these books you've chosen. Right, the books you chose in in the uh, in, in the book you wrote, reading the evangelicals. Right, you love comes softly, which I actually had never heard of. Okay. The present darkness, yes. Left behind, yes. The shunning, never heard of. The shack, had heard of. So the this present darkness left behind in the shack. I guess I guess there wasn't a concern about, or there wasn't a question about this. But the ones you've heard of and not heard of, this just tells me you're a dude. That's the, that's the thing you're saying line. Though. That that is totally true because if you ask my wife, I'm sure she's heard of every one of them. Yeah. The other thing that when people tell me what they've heard, you know, these books span a 40 year process. Most people don't right, we're right. read popular novels for 40 years. They tend to occupy like I read them as a kid, or I read them in middle age, or I read them in retirement. So most people, you know. Most people I talk to, they've they know like two or three really well, and the others maybe not so well or haven't heard of them. But yeah, Love Comes Softly is a romance novel, and The Shunning I include Harry Potter in that list. <laughs> I, was, I was confused. Well, I also didn't include things like um, The Chronicles of Narnia, yeah, or right. Tolkien. And the big issue there is that you know, they were published by mainstream presses. So even though mm -hmm. there are books that have Christian themes, um, I mean, I think the best-selling evangelical author of all time is probably John Grisham, you know, who's also a Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher, or at least was. Really? Yeah. Interesting. But, but, but I was looking for specifically um, Christian publishers, evangelical publishers, and evangelical distribution networks and Christian bookstores. So how, again, how do we, how right. do we track the creation of a community? So it's not just me saying, oh, this theme seems Christian and this theme doesn't, but, but, um, paying attention to the infrastructure that shapes and contains that imagination. That, that's re that's really, um, interesting because. I mean, I haven't read any like Christian books or or anything like that. I, mean, I, I, I didn't grow up Christian. Um, my my wife um, was the one that brought me to Christ, um, and you know that was back in two thousand eight or something like that. <clears throat> so, so fortunately for me, yeah, like I get a I get experience a lot of like 
new Christian stuff that's really old. <clears throat> so like when when we when I started listening to Christian music, I'm listening to like third day stuff, and I'm like, oh, this is a really cool song, you know? And you talk, yeah. you're like, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah, and, and my my wife's like, yeah, the song's like 30 years old, you know? <laughs> I'm like, oh, it sounds it sounds cool and relevant, you know? But um, but but I but I'm curious about you know the the Christian books. Uh, or the, the Christian fiction books shaping culture um, and and what you think are like other what are what are other sort of like modern day influences on Christian culture um, that that you think you know com are are comparable to to Christian fiction yeah I'm clear in the book that I don't think I don't think novels are like mysteriously, specially the only thing. <laughs> what, I mean, novels a good way to a good way into imagination is because they leave such a clear record. This goes back to what I was saying about journalism of like what kind of records exist and how do I find them? Hey. You know, you can find pretty good sales records. Um, you can find pretty good. One of my innovations was to start using Goodreads to find reviews, right? So when people read the book, what did they say? When they hated a book, what did they say? That's really hard to find, for example, with like concerts or mm. conferences, right? Like I, I can tell you X number of people went to this Christian conference in 1982, but Presumably they didn't all feel the same way, right? Presumably some people left and were like, that was the best experience of my life. And I just feel so on fire for Jesus. And other people were like, what are we, why did we spend that money? Yeah, but you can't tell, right? You just have to guess. And so novels gave me kind of, kind of access, but, but I really think any cultural object that brings people together, that's what we're looking for. Anything that links people um that puts people in in in, uh, in conversation or the academic term is imagined community right or discourse community um so so yeah. when you think think about any group that you belong to or that you any identity that you have when you imagine that identity and maybe it's like for me someone who lives in tennessee or evangelical or um you know a political identity maybe you're like i'm a moderate you you kind of imagine everybody else who's in that group what do you culturally what do you need to kind of construct that picture that you have well it's it's some stuff right it's some conversational stuff and it's not an object like i don't know a car it, it's about community it's about um conversation and it's kind of a, a, a and it flows right it also changes over time so magazines i think are super important conferences are super important to the construction of evangelicalism music is super important i have a friend who's currently writing a book on on contemporary christian music leah Payne, which will be that'll be great when it comes out um traveling preachers celebrities you know anything where you know if you're watching a celebrity i mean think about someone now right if if um robert jeffress from first baptist in dallas gets up and says all christian on fox news and says all christians support donald trump yeah. and you identify with that you're also imagining everybody else who agrees with that and if you disagree right. with that, you're also kind of imagining <laughs> Well, I'm I'm one of the Christians who hears that and thinks, "Who are you? How dare you talk for all of us?" You know. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's really. I'm curious on your um, on your thoughts about how how that kind of stuff shapes our theology, um, and you know, specifically, you know, whether it's it's um, novels, um, music, uh, movies, in particular. Um, um, like, like we just saw, uh, we, we, we went to the movies recently and saw the, uh, movie family camp. Um, it was like a skit guys production. It was actually pretty decent, you know? And, and, and I, and I remember leaving, leaving that movie thinking like, well, that wasn't terrible because like most Christian movies by and by are really terrible. Um, <laughs> and, but, but I, but I know that they cater to a certain audience and, um, I'm curious if you think that any of this 
you know, media, um, specifically in the entertainment world, you know, has a role to play in shaping theology as well. Yeah, it's hard for it's hard for Christian movies to get a big enough budget to actually um, live up to the quality. That's another reason novels are more interesting, like the cost <laughs> of writing a novel is low enough that you can get some good ones. Um, yeah, so so first a, a caution. When people talk about pop culture shaping theology, the the thing that they mostly do in the way that I think they sort of go wrong is by imagining that other people are stupid and just read a novel and automatically believe everything it says. <laughs> um, and I think we should assume that everybody else is as smart as we are. I think that's a really good, like, strategic approach to trying to study culture. Um, and when you dig a little deeper, what you see is that it does shape theology. It does shape the way people view the world, but people are really creative. People adapt part, they pick up part, they reject part. Um, they, they, they kind of play around with it. And this even goes into what, what happens with novels. Like if you think about a novel, like you kind of imagine the person's experience, right? You kind of pretend that you're that person. You, you're almost like play acting. You're pretending to be the main character. But then, of course, you put it down and walk away, right? You, 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 right. you, take, you put it on and take off the imagined reality of a, of a novel. And maybe you read a novel and it's like there are robots attacking from outer space. And you're like, okay. But then you walk away and like you don't believe robots are attacking from outer space, right? It's a special kind of suspension of disbelief, not belief. Um, so it, I, I think it's really helpful to think about like how people are suspending disbelief when they read a Christian novel, which can turn into belief, but doesn't necessarily turn into belief. But but then how does it shape fiction? I, how does it shape what we believe? I think. Um, if you identify with it strongly, if you really embrace it, what it does is convey values. It conveys um, um, sensibilities. So the question I end up looking at the most with these five novels was, what does belief look like in this novel? How do they imagine that people move from, I believe that Jesus is Christ, the son of the living God, to it's Tuesday and my neighbor's annoying, right? Like that's, that's, it's going to work out somehow, but how does it work out? And the novels actually present like pretty different ideas of what that looks like. Um, and I think that's the, I think that's the primary influence that it has that was shaping my, well, it could look like that, or I didn't think that version seemed very plausible. Um, it doesn't feel like that to me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What, what, so what does like say the shack tell us about evangelicals that, and, and, and then like maybe like, um, you know, this present tar darkness tell us about evangelicals and how are those, are they compatible? Like, did you find, like, what kind of conflicts did you find? What kind of inconsistencies did you find? Yeah, like, there are. Watching this? There are definitely internal tensions in the Christian fiction market. Um, sometimes stuff can be merged and sometimes it gets a little more tricky. Um, but then also people, you know, readers are really free to kind of adopt part and reject the other part. My favorite example of that is um, um, the Left Behind novels, which were huge and they were everywhere. And, and I, uh, a curious thing about the apocalypticism of Left Behind is it's very pro-technology. <laughs> in the novels, like the heroes, the Christian heroes who are fighting the Antichrist almost become like hackers. Like they use the internet. <laughs> they love tech. Uh, but when you talk to people and you read what people write, they will say, you yeah, know, it really feels, it really felt good to me. It really felt like this is what our world is becoming with all of this bad computer stuff. And it's like, people would people would change the novel from what it says being pro-technology to being like, I'm this novel resonated with me because I'm concerned about technology. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of, 
liberal reading that that uh, that we get. Um, but yeah, so the shack. To answer your question, the shack um, is really a story about um, I mean, the, the basic plot for people who don't know is a man, a man's child is murdered, and he really is struggling with the idea that God can be good. And he ends up going into the woods to the cabin where his daughter was murdered and having an experience with, um, with the Trinity. So with all three persons of the Trinity, it kind of has a, goes on like a retreat with God. That novel ends up telling a story about, um, faith encouraging us to live in ambiguity and in relationships and not needing definitive answers to everything. Um, and it does this by doing things like uh, adopting postmodern uh, writing styles. So in postmodern literature, for example, uh, the novels will often raise questions about who the author is and how there's a sort of presentation of the author, but maybe you shouldn't trust the author or maybe um, the real author is actually a composite character or something like that. Um, and it raises, yeah, the ambiguity of authorship is one approach. And you see this absolutely in, 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 um, in the shack, the, there's a character in the book, uh, who's supposedly writing things, but then you get another character who tells you, Hey, by the way, actually, I wrote all this on his behalf. This person isn't real or this person, uh, wasn't a good writer. So I, I'm telling you the story just so you know. But, but what's going to sound like they're writing the story, but actually they didn't write any of the story. So it raises this kind of ambiguity that you then have to just kind of live with. Um, and William Paul Young's idea of what it means to be a Christian in the 21st century is this kind of postmodern experience of mm. we, li we don't have certainty, but that's okay. Now, to contrast that to something else, you said this present darkness, but but let's go with a stronger contra contrast, um, um, Left Behind. Yeah. Left Behind is the story of the rapture. All the true Christians at the beginning of the novel get caught, I'm not spoiling anything. This is on page two or three. <laughs> and also, it's from the mid-90s. You should have, you, you should have you know, caught up by now. No spoilers. Um all the Christ all the true Christians are caught up into heaven. And so everyone, everyone in the novel after this is living with the experience of um, a dramatic intervention of God into human history. And then there's the problem that not everybody thinks the same way about that dramatic intervention of God. And so they all start having debates. The heroes of the novels are the ones who knew Christians and came to the conclusion from the perspective of the novel, the correct conclusion that this was the rapture, but they keep running into people who are like, I don't know. It could have been aliens. It could have been a secret weapon. And, and they, and the novel sets up this dichotomy where it's not actually possible to be honestly wrong. And so it keeps forcing people, forcing characters into this apologetic space where they have to choose between the truth and the falseness. And there's one correct choice. And if you're honest, you'll, you know what that correct choice is. So it's actually only dishonesty or bad faith or something else. So it's actually not a complicated world um, where we have to live with ambiguities and certain uncertainty and epistemic humility, which just means like, I don't really know if I know what I think I know. I think I know, but maybe not. And I'm going to keep listening to other people in case I hear something that makes me want to shift. Left behind, no, no, no. You know, and you're self-deceiving if you think you don't. And God yeah. is God. So, yeah, so those are not... Those are not exactly compatible, um, yeah. oh, at least, but of course you can read both novels and, and enjoy them and maybe identify with the core themes of one and the peripheral themes of another. Mm -hmm. The other thing I found was that Left Behind, for example, was really important to a lot of Christians who didn't like it. It was such a popular book that it became a like shorthand. So I don't know, this is a few years, few years old, but... Uh, in the early 2000s, there was a whole group of people that were describing themselves as emergent or emerging Christians. Yeah. Um, and 
there are a bunch of authors who identified as emergent who wrote books about like, here's what emergent Christianity is. Here's what I mean by that. Let's talk about it. But the book that got mentioned most by those people was actually left behind. It was a really easy book to say, Hey, you know, this we're, we're not like that. Like this is a really useful book for the conversation, but like, wait, yeah, we don't like, this is something else. <laughs> um, we're over here. So that's part of the way that, you know, books can shape, especially really popular books can shape conversations in pretty complicated ways. Yeah. I, I, I've always long thought, I mean, so I'm a big, I'm a big Marvel fan. And, um, I think, I think, um, you know, Marvel's missing a big opportunity here when Thanos did his snap. Um, and, and it, and if you could hone in on certain communities in America, Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> like, like there's probably a lot of people just sitting in church and all of a sudden like their their loved ones is like they're gone you know and they're wondering what the heck has happened uh so you know the um kevin feige you know if you if you want to take that idea it's all yours by the way um but i want to i want to i want to ask you uh, daniel about uh, about something um there's a there's a lot of talk right now and actually like front page news talk about sexual misconduct in in the church specifically like the SBC the Southern Baptist Convention um, and I know that you've you've written a lot about this um, you alluded to it earlier about Ravi Zacharias um, and whatnot but you also wrote about some some sexual misconduct within your own organization um, Christianity today and I'd love for you to kind of just talk a little bit about that um, you know talk about like if, if it was weird to write, because it's, it's all, it's all, I'm, I'm always impressed by journalists that can write about stuff that happens within their own house. Um, cause I know that's, that's gotta be difficult. Um, so, so maybe you can kind of walk us through that. Yeah. yeah. Early in that process, I had to go looking for good examples. Who's done this well. Um, NPR ended up being the example that I modeled my approach on. David Fulfenflick has written multiple pieces on sexual harassment at NPR for NPR. Um, so he was kind of the, the example. They don't teach you how to do that in journalism classes. That's not like <laughs> it's pretty unusual. Um, but yeah, and for those who don't know, there was uh, sexual harassment at Christianity Today um, by two top, um, two leaders, two department managers. Um, and my reporting found that it went on for um, at least 12 years um, unchecked so wow. that the, the company, the executive team did not take steps to stop the sexual harassment. The fact of sexual harassment is not that surprising, like it happens. The, the real problem is when an institution decides we're just going to live with it, or it's not real, or this person is too special to be, to be corrected. Um, and I reported on this, on this history for Christianity Today, um, a couple of months ago. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, I think, I think as a Christian, you know, I really believe that we have to be committed to the truth over tribalism. That's a lot of what drives journalism. Um, and I think we have to hold ourselves accountable um, mm -hmm. and not spend our time focusing on other people and holding other people accountable. And I think there's, you know, there's just a natural human tendency to think, well, my side, we're the good guys, we're the white hats and those guys, they're the bad guys. Um, and that's not what we do as journalists and that's not what we do as Christians either. Um, we're committed to the, to the truth above all. So even when it hurts, you have to talk about it. You have to go after it. Um, yeah. That's really cool. I, um, I should say, I should say too, that the, the current administration of Christianity today was very supportive of this and gave me gave me the freedom to do it. You know, they didn't interfere. They're like, you report on it, you make the decisions. It was me and my, and my boss, my direct boss, the senior news reporter, Kate Shelnut. Um, and, and this, and the, the, the ministry is, which includes the magazine is, is working on making things better in ways that I find pretty encouraging. It's awesome. That's so awesome. I love that. Um, 
So this is my last question. This is our last question. We have like uh, we've talked about this before, but this um, there's a wide variety of listeners we have. Um, what is one thing that you would want to like uh, that you would feel like is important about your work and everything that you would want to that you would want to tell them? Um, or about life in general, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, my book is for sale. You can buy it anywhere. If yes. I'm we will um, get to that. We'll, we'll, we'll have you tell people how they can. Get into it. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the core of my work, both the journalism and the history, is really about trying to understand people. And I'm especially kind of compelled when it's quick or easy to dismiss or diminish or just think, man, those novels look dumb. Um, I kind of think, you know, my own approach is that anytime there's something that a bunch of people think is dumb, that's probably pretty interesting. And you could, if you stop and dug a little bit, you'll actually find some good stuff out. Um, and that that should be like a red flag for you. Like, oh, go investigate over there. Everyone hates that thing. What What's going on there? Um, and then I would say the other thing is, yeah, what I was talking about a little bit with the abuse is just a, a commitment to understanding, a commitment to deeply, accurately understanding and, and trying to get at the, the truth, especially when the truth is hard to get at. It can be hard to get at because it's something ephemeral, like a pop novel that people haven't read for 40 years, or it can be hard to get at um, because a powerful person is trying to cover it up. Um, but I think it's worth the, the fight to try and get at that truth. Yeah. You know, and, and I would, I would just, you know, extend sort of my gratitude, um, to just the work you do. I mean, um, yeah. those that listen to our show know that we really appreciate the work that journalists do and bring to light certain things that, you know, really deserve to have that light shined on it. And specifically in the Christian community, uh, community, which I belong to, and so does Josh and yourself, like, I've long believed that a lot of these sort of issues that we see within the church community need to be handled within the church community. Otherwise, like they would be handled by others. <laughs> so, so whether it's the SBC or, you know, Robbie Zacharias's organization, um, you know, I, I, I think it's important that all churches collectively, you know, speak sort of with one voice and say, this isn't necessarily the, you know, how a Christian should behave. And we, you know, we, we, we tell people that, yep, we, we see the problem, we're fixing it. And even if it's not happening at our church, like we're going to, we're going to take it to heart and make sure that it doesn't happen at our church. Cause otherwise it's like, yeah. you know, we can have like the government all of a sudden saying, well, why do churches need, you know, 503, you know, 501c3, uh, a tax exemption status if, you know, they're going to be doing this kind of stuff. So, yeah. um, so I really appreciate just the work that you do. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate thank you. that. I would say too, you know, they're, they're, it's important for us as Christians to listen to the people who don't agree with us, who are also yeah. in the truth. You know, there is no track record that I know of, of any religious organization holding itself accountable on sexual abuse without media calling it to attention first. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, Christianity today, because we are evangelical because we share some of those commitments. We have some trusts that maybe another organization doesn't have, but, um, you know, the Southern Baptists wouldn't have done what they were doing without the Houston Chronicle documenting lots and lots of abuse. Um, and the Catholic church, which none of us are Catholic, but the Catholic church wouldn't have done what it was doing without the Boston globe and the famous spotlight mm -hmm. doing what they were doing. So, yeah. We have to, we have to get past the instinct where we only trust certain people and we automatically distrust certain people. I think back to uh, the the Old Testament story of Balaam and the donkey. You know, sometimes it's a donkey telling you, "Hey, don't go that direction, or God's gonna kill you." And you gotta learn, you gotta learn to listen to your donkeys. And if we as journalists are the donkeys, I'm fine with that. But please listen. Is a donkey an allegory for, for Democrat? I'm curious. <laughs> and this, in the Bible right there. In 
this story, it's from it's uh, the journalists. But yeah, I hear what you're <laughs> well, thank you so much, Daniel. How can people find your work? Yeah, on uh, Christianity Today on the website, ChristianityToday.com. I report and edit the news section there. I'm also very active on Twitter, so people can find me at Daniel Silliman. All right, great. Well, Daniel, thank you so much, guys. This has been Daniel Silliman. It's such a pleasure to have you on today. Thanks. It's good to be here. Thanks, guys. See you, guys, we'll see you next uh, time. And until then, uh, stay safe and keep looking up.